You have heard it just like I have. It must not have been a foul. The ref didn't call it. It must not have been a penalty. The ref didn't throw a flag. It must not be a crime. I didn't get caught. You're not speeding, are you? Unless the policeman pulls you over. And then you're mad, not because you were speeding. We're mad because we got caught. We live an illusion that just because there's a delay between the committing of the crime and the judgment due, that judgment will never come at all. One of the things that the world doesn't want you to know is this, is that within each sin is its own judgment. Within each sin is its own judgment. And it's just a matter of time before the process works and judgment comes for each sin. Now, some of us confuse this, and this is what Peter is addressing. We, we assume that because God hasn't, that He won't. We assume or confuse patience with weakness. We confuse where we are in the process. We think we're between the crime and getting caught. We may be between the verdict and the coming sentence. Many of us are guilty. We just haven't been sentenced. We confuse mercy with weakness. That's what Peter is talking about in the second letter, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. <laughs> Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay. But is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to eternal life. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Help us tell time as you do. And help us understand that this time of hesitation is a time of mercy, a time of redemption, before there's no time left. And we pray this in your name. Amen. We think 2 Peter was one of the last letters written that made its way into the New Testament. Uh, some scholars have it even after uh, AD 100 because the author is addressing uh, a mature gospel. That's one of the reasons we think this was a, a later letter. That is, the gospel had been preached for some time. Everybody kind of knew the gospel in the church, and it had been preached long enough for there to be an alternative gospel. Had there been a, there, there now it was a reaction to the gospel that was being preached by the apostles and by the early church. Now, there are a lot of, of, of discussions about what kind of reaction this was, about what kind of, of, of heresy was being taught. But basically what we have is the beginning of what we call Gnosticism. Gnosticism is from the Greek word gnosis, which is knowledge. And the basic teaching was that the gospel that Jesus brought us, the gospel that the apostles was preaching, was good as far as it went. But there was more. 
And this is the more that the apostles didn't tell you that we has been revealed to us this secret knowledge, this gnosis that we now live by that helps us understand that human beings are spiritual creatures and not physical creatures, that we can live any way we want to or need to in our physical bodies, but it doesn't affect our spiritual reality. And that if you work at it hard enough, you can become a God yourself. Now, there's a, there's a couple of things uh, wrong with that. One, salvation, truth, wisdom is all centered in the person. You become the determiner of what, what brings you salvation. And you get to work out what is right for you. And that if maybe being part of a local church hinders your spiritual growth, then, then you don't go to church. Or, or maybe if certain commandments hinder you from fulfilling all that you're created to be, then, then you ignore those sections of the Scripture. Uh, you don't recognize the authority of anybody else that they may have uh, to be able to speak into your life because you are the center of, of all authority. And that you determine whether or not something is true. And that someone will bring you truth and you will say, mm, I don't know, that may be true for you. I'm not sure it's true for me. Have you ever wondered how that actually works? Our culture says this all the time. I'm glad you have found your truth, but that can't be truth for me. I tried that on a math test one time. <laughs> and the professor assured me that her truth was the truth. And if I ever wanted to get out of her class, I would come to the point where I agreed with her. Now, the more you study this, the more you recognize, whoa, we've seen this before. Where have we seen this before? Uh, in any movie, in any sitcom, uh, in any of the public discussion that is now going on, no one has the right to tell me what to do with my life. Nobody has a right to, to hold me accountable in anything. Nobody has a right uh, to ask me to be responsible for anything. I am the one who determines what I want and what I need, and it's all up to me. This um, culture of me, this culture of narcissism, and, uh, and, and it's all about me and what I'm doing and how I feel and what I want. Uh, we have come all of this way as human beings to end up right where we were. And what the early church is dealing with and what, they, what historians call Gnosticism, we're now dealing with in postmodernism, post-Christian America. It's the same. The church uh, that Peter was addressing had a double whammy. They were oppressed by the Roman government and by the political uh, entities of local cities and that kind of thing. Uh, and you'll find in other of Peter's letters uh, encouragement to hang in there, uh, to live rightly, to live righteously, to live truthfully, to live faithfully, regardless of what's going on. It's Peter who says, do not give the culture around you, reason to disbelieve the gospel because of the way that you act. And if you are suffering for the truth, then you are blessed. Now, the heresy of Gnosticism, the heresy that we now see, basically tries to take the cross out of the gospel. It tries to take suffering out of the gospel. And you can become all that you're created to be and not have to endure any kind of pain, any kind of frustration. And if that you're in God's will, everything works out for you. You can always find a parking place. Your clothes always fit. You can always, you can eat as many Oreos as you want and not gain any weight. If you're doing what the Lord wants you to do, then you are blessed like this. Have you heard this? Is this, a, this is not, this out there, okay? Obviously, Jesus did not get that word. So, Peter says a couple of things to the early church. One, you can't tell time. 
How do you tell time when eternity is your baseline for time? For God, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. You know what the old preachers did with that, don't you? The old country preachers? If a day is like a thousand years, then Jesus has only been gone a couple of days. He does one a couple of things. One, God is in control of time. And if he decides not to act now, then that's up to him, and he's acting according to his divine purposes. Now, this prayer of how long, how long do we have to wait, how long do we have to do it, is an ancient prayer. It goes way back. Um, the prophet Isaiah. Prophet Isaiah is called of God. Who will I go? God says, here I am, send me. Isaiah says, God says to Isaiah, I'm going to send you to a hard-headed, stiff-necked people. You will preach my word. They will not listen. Isaiah's response, how long? Book of Revelation, the prayer of the 144,000, the church suffering in, 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 in the earth while God is bringing judgment. There's 144,000 is before the throne begging God, how long? How long do we have to wait for justice? How long do we have to wait until you avenge us? And God tells them, until I bring all my children home. So there's two points here. One, don't confuse patience mercy with weakness. Don't assume that because he hasn't, he won't. Now, some of us think that, well, you know, I did this, I did that, I didn't get struck by lightning, I must have gotten away with it. We were translating the book of Amos in the second year of Hebrew. My professor, J.J. Owens, wrote the book on how you translate Hebrew. He would walk into our class with a Hebrew Bible and hold us over hell like a marshmallow for the next several hours. <laughs> he would mistranslate something on purpose and wait for somebody to challenge him on the mistranslation. And then if you couldn't defend it, he would just barbecue you. So we just let him slide, you know, <laughs> try it with us. Then he'd get mad, we didn't chat, then he'd get, it was, it was awful. <clears throat> you know what the final was? You had an appointment with him, you went in his office, you sat down, you read Hebrew together. He would say, what's your favorite verse? You would open, you'd read it. He would say, here's my favorite verse. And it would be some obscure passage <laughs> nobody ever read, even in English. And, <laughs> Sweat dripping off your face. He would torment. It was awful. We're doing the book of Amos. Amos has this famous phrase where he talks about the cities around Jerusalem and Jerusalem. And he says, for the three sins of Jerusalem, yea, even for four, I will not cause it to turn back. When you start breaking that apart in Hebrew, it is a horrible prophecy. What Amos is saying to all of these cities is for three sins, biblical number three, for, for sinning until you become sin, and even four, more than total. There's more than I can count. For all of these sins, I'm not going to cause it to turn back. Here's what Amos is saying. When you sin, you start the mechanism for your judgment. Okay, it starts working through the process. Now, when you sin, if you don't get struck by lightning, you thought you got away with it. You didn't. It's working. And sooner or later, it will come back as judgment. Now, you know this because in our own slang, you hear things like, well, the bills come due, chickens come home to roost. All of those things, that's what that's about. It just takes time sometime, and this time is mercy. And what Amos is telling these great cities is that God has put his hand in this mechanism. 
and all of your judgment for all of your sins is piling up behind the hand of God like a river is dammed up by a dam. It doesn't go away, it's just piling up. Because you're on the other side of God's hand, we think we've gotten away with it. You haven't. He's given you time to get things right. He's given you time to confess. He's given you time to repent. He's given you time to turn back to Him. But what Amos says to these cities is you've run out of time. And God is going to take His hand out of the machinery. Now, you always think, I always think, that you finally get a point where God just is so mad, He's just going to grab a handful of lightning bolts and fry us all. Right? It's much worse than that. It's much worse than that. What God says is, I'm going to take my hand out of the machinery, and what will come to your life are the consequences of your own decisions. you will get exactly what you have chosen. And what makes it hell is that this is what you and I chose. Don't mistake mercy for weakness. Don't think because God hasn't that He won't. The other thing, this is time for you to repent. God is holding off judgment to the very last moment, hoping as many of us as possible will run in Find our way home before time runs out. As long as he possibly can. Noah built the ark. And the reason it took him a hundred years is that he was working with one hand and preaching with the other. Warning people about a judgment that they couldn't see and didn't believe, and so they never acted. But for a hundred years Noah preached. And finally the rains came. And when the rains came it was too late. Time and time and time again the invitation is offered, the truth is proclaimed, and you think there's more time. And the first thing that Peter tells us is we don't know how to tell time. Is it a day or is it a thousand years? How can you confuse the two? You don't know how to tell time. So Jesus waits one more time. And maybe you're the one we're waiting on. The old preachers tell a story of Satan having a a meeting with all of his demons. Seems that things weren't going as well as Satan had hoped, and he needed a new plan. He was open to suggestions. The first demon said, we'll tell them there's no God. Tried that, Satan said. Didn't work. Next one said, We'll tell them it doesn't matter. Just go ahead and live as you want to. Jesus will forgive you in the end. Satan said, tried that. Mixed results. Finally one stepped up and he says, I have it. Here's what we'll do. We'll tell them there is no hurry. We'll tell them there is no hurry. I know. We live in a culture that tells me I'm not supposed to tell you about judgment. 
I'm not supposed to frighten you like that. I'm supposed to give you a couple of happy thoughts that will make you feel better during the week. But to do that would not be to fulfill my call. It would not be to love you. Because some of you need to hear. You don't have the time you think you do. Some of you need to hear that you have confused mercy with weakness. And you've made the fatal assumption that because God hasn't to this point, that he won't. God always keeps his promises. And he'll keep that promise too.